distant fall How it ends It's the fall Greetings everyone. Welcome to today's Physio TV session. I am Dr. Saumya Gandhi, finally a postgraduate of Santeri Institute College of Physiotherapy and I'm going to talk today about probably one of the most skipped pages of Cynthia Norkins which is ankle and foot complex. So hopefully it's not going to be that complicated after this session. So let's start first with the overview of the foot and ankle. Since we have our undergrads also seen this, we'll quickly brush through the anatomy and then move on to the biomechanics. So when I talk about the um, foot and ankle, when I talk about ankle, it primarily refers to the talocrural joint, which is the articulation between the tibia fibula and that is the distal end of the tibia fibula and the talus. And when I talk about the foot, I can actually divide the foot into a hind foot, the mid foot and the forefoot. So my hind foot will have the talus, the calcaneum and the subtalar joint. My uh, mid foot will have the remaining tarsals and the transverse tarsal joint. And my forefoot will have the metatarsal, the MTP joint and the phalanges along with its joint. So uh, uh, talking about the articular surfaces of the ankle joint. Now uh, we can actually look at ankle joint as a carpenter's mortise joint. So this is the proximal articulating surface which is made by the distal tibia fibula and this is my distal articular surface which is made by the body of the talus. Uh, coming to a better diagrammatic uh, review. So if you see this, actually the distal end of the tibia fibula which is a syndesmotic joint does not come in close contact with each other but rather it is separated by a fibroadipose tissue it has no joint capsule, but you will have ligaments which are going to stabilize this. You have your anterior and posterior tibiofibular joint uh, ligament, sorry, and the interosseous membrane here. So if you see in this picture, I have my interosseous membrane and I have my anterior and posteriorly I will have my uh, posterior tibiofibular ligament. The function, <coughs> sorry. the function of my ankle joint is dependent on how stable this mortise is going to be. And the mobility role of this mortise will greatly depend on the fibula, which is transmitting, say, no more than 10% of the body weight. But again, studies have said that the uh, weight transmission through the fibula actually depends on, or the axial load through the fibula actually depends on what is the position of the ankle, saying that the greatest forces are transmitted by the ankle was in eversion. And the distal articular surface, that I've said, is made by the body of the talus. So the body of the talus, if you see, is wider anteriorly and then it narrows down. So it's like a wedge-shaped structure. 
Coming to the ligaments, now the capsule around the ankle joint is very thin and weak. So the major stability is going to be provided by the ligaments which are around the ankle joint. Mainly, you have the anterior talofibular, um, sorry, mainly we have the tibiofibular ligament. So if you see here, the anterior tibiofibular ligament, the posterior tibiofibular ligament, and we have the interosseous membrane which are going to stabilize the ankle joint. And when you talk about the subtalar joint, you have your medial complex and the lateral complex. So medial complex, the ligaments go from the medial malleolus. So you have, if you see, you have the tibionavicular, the tibiocalcane and the tibiotalar fibers, which form the medial collateral ligament or the deltoid ligament. And on the lateral side, you have the anterior talofibular ligament which is stressed when the ankle moves in plantar flexion, inversion and adduction. You have the posterior talofibular ligament, which is nearly horizontal and it is going to be stressed when the ankle moves in dorsiflexion and adduction. And then you have third ligament, the calcaneofibular ligament, which is nearly vertical and it is going to be stressed when the ankle moves in dorsiflexion and inversion. So if you see the talofibular is the weakest and the most commonly injured ligament out of the three. And you, we all know that the lateral collateral complex is more easily injured than the medial. Talking about the axis of ankle joint, so in a neutral ankle position, the axis is going to pass through the fibular malleolus, the body of the talus and slightly below the medial malleolus. So roughly 14 degrees inclined from the transverse plane and 23 degrees inclined from the frontal plane. Now this obliquity is because my distal end of the fibula is at a lower and posterior position as compared to my medial malleolus, as compared to my distal end of the tibia. So during dorsiflexion, what happens, uh, you all can also try this. So when in non-weight bearing position, if I have to dorsiflex, my foot is actually going to move upward. Along with that, it is going to move slightly away from the midline, outward. Now, this happens because we saw the obliquity of the axis of the ankle joint. So dorsiflexion is going to be associated with eversion and slight abduction and vice versa for my plantar flexion. So by definition, my ankle joint should have movements of pronation and supination. But if you see, the axis is very minimally deviated from the center. So that's why clinically these small movements of adduction, abduction and inversion, eversion can be ignored. And that's why we say the ankle joint commonly performs the dorsiflexion and plantar flexion movement with dorsiflexion being roughly 20 degrees and plantar flexion being roughly 50 degrees. And also remember that when you need ambulation, you need a minimum of 10 degrees of dorsiflexion. Moving to the joint motion. Now in non-weight bearing, what happens is I have my concave and con uh, I have my concave and convex. Now this is in non-weight bearing position, it's my talus which is going to move, which means it's going to roll forward and it's going to slide posteriorly. It is seen that in this position, my calcaneofibular ligament, which is here and my posterior capsule and all the posterior tissues are going to be taut because there's a posterior glide there is going to be a taut or a stretch on these structures during dorsiflexion so when you have maximal dorsiflexion it's going to elongate the posterior capsule and all the tissues that are capable of transmitting plantar flexion torque like the achilles tendon and vice versa for plantar flexion what happens in weight bearing in weight bearing it is not the talus, it's the tibia which is going to rotate over the talus, which means my concave segment is going to slide forward. Now, we said that the talus is a wedge-shaped structure, which means the wide anterior portion of the talus is now going to wedge into the mortise. It's going to separate the tibia and the fibula. And in plantar flexion, what happens? The small posterior portion is going to be in the mortise, which means it's a very loose packed position A. And secondly, because I have very little congruency between the two articular structures, it's going to be less stable and more prone to injury. So you always see that the uh, structures are going to be more injured when the foot goes into a plantar flexion movement. Also, uh, the fibular facet is substantially larger than my tibial facet. So there is an asymmetry in the size, which means that my distal end of the fibula has to move a larger arc to perform the same movement, which is going to result 
in a uh, superior inferior and medial lateral rotation of the fibula which will require mobility at both the distal and the proximal tibiofibular joint so also this is one of the reason that when you talk about the ankle joint you have to take into consideration the proximal tibiofibular joint as well uh, this is roughly of how the graph is actually showing the talocrural joint through the stance phase. So here I'm only talking about the talocrural. So we're only going to focus on the dorsiflexion and plantar flexion movement. Now we have, so this is my baseline. I have my dorsiflexion. I have my plantar flexion. And this is my heel contact, flat foot, heel off, toe off, which comprises my push off motion. And then I have my swing phase. So if you see, at initial uh, heel contact, the ankle is rapidly going into a plantar flexion, okay? And as soon, so that happens when you have to lower the foot. And as soon as the foot flat stage reaches, from there, it starts going into dorsiflexion till after heel of phase. Okay, and at this point, if you see, there is maximum dorsiflexion. We had already discussed that when there is maximal dorsiflexion, my collateral ligaments are taught, my posterior structures are taught, and also the wide anterior portion is lodged in the uh, mortis. So this is the most stable position. It's a close pack position. And uh, when maximum dorsiflexion occurs, we also set the tibia and fibula slightly separate. So that will be resisted by the tibiofibular ligaments, okay? And the natural spreading will cause slight superior fibular translation also. And that will be, the force will be transferred to the proximal tibiofibular joint. So this was all about the ankle joint. The next joint we're going to talk about is the subtalar joint. Now the subtalar joint is also called the talocalcaneal joint and it is one of the most important joints because it produces your pronation supination movements which are required when you want to dampen forces when you are walking on uneven terrain. So we'll first see what the articulation is. So we have an anterior, medial and posterior articulation. Posterior articulation, I'll just show you here. So this is the posterior articulation of the subtalar joint, which is between the convex facet of the calcaneum and the concave facet of the uh, talus. Anterior, compared to the posterior, the anterior and the middle. Anterior is not appreciated in this picture. And this is my middle. You see, it is the convex talus and the concave um, calcaneum similarly for the anterior okay now between my anterior middle and my posterior somewhere here just above the sustaniculum talus you have a tunnel which is called the tarsal tunnel okay the lateral end which is a larger facet this opening here is called the tarsal sinus and here I have a smaller opening just above the sustanticulum talus. Uh, anterior and middle uh, articulations have their own capsule and also they share the capsule with the talonavicular joint which is formed here. The posterior facet, one important thing to remember is when the poses are transmitted, the body weight is transmitted on the foot. Uh, approximately 75% of these forces are taken up by your posterior articulation. Okay, so in this, you have what is important is where my tarsal sinus is and the posterior articulation. Going to the ligaments of the subtalar joint. Now, the ligaments, basically the subtalar joint is supported by my calcaneofibular ligament, which is here present laterally. So what is its main function is going to be to prevent excessive inversion. You have the deltoid, which is present medially. Main function is excessive eversion, uh, restrict, restriction of excessive eversion, okay? Both of these ligaments we've already spoken of uh, before. Then you have the lateral talocalcaneal, which will be located a little bit anterior to the calcaneofibular, but deeper to this, okay? So again, not appreciated in the picture. And uh, the main function is going to be, it reinforces the posterior capsule. And then I have two ligaments, the cervical ligament, which is one of the strongest, and the interosseous talocalcaneal ligament, which lies more medially to the, than the cervical ligament. And both of these are going to limit extremes of all motions, most notably uh, inversion. So again, the axis of subtalar joint, if you see here, it is inclined upwards 42 degrees, upwards and anteriorly. 
and 16 degrees medially. Now, since there was a difference in the articulation between the posterior articulation versus anterior and middle, uh, while posterior was concave, moving on convex, and in the anterior and middle, we had the opposite. So, there is going to be a triplanar motion around a single oblique axis which is happening, and that is what produces my pronation and supination. So, if you see here, the osteokinematics, we've already seen what the axis of motion um, around the subtalar joint is. Two of the three main components of pronation and supination are strongly evident. So, one, if you see here, when there is pronation, the main component that I can see here is there is eversion. So, there is eversion and abduction. And in supination, there is inversion and adduction. So, pronation, therefore, will have main components of eversion, abduction seen in this picture and supination is vice versa. The calcaneus does not uh, does dorsiflex and plantar flex slightly relative to the talus, but this motion is usually ignored clinically, like how in the ankle joint, we did not um, really give importance to the pronation supination movement. So, the inversion is roughly 20 to 25 degrees and around 10 to 15 degrees of eversion is present. Talking about the non-weight bearing motion at the subtalar joint, so uh, the calcaneal motions for subtalar are very visible. Like if you see in diagram A, my pronation includes calcaneal eversion, which is the most evident. But also, like we said, there is a little bit of dorsiflexion as well, along with abduction. And for supination, it's going to be vice versa. So it is inversion, plantar flexion and adduction. Weight bearing is different in, uh, the, the motion is going to be different. So in my weight bearing pronation, what happens basically is my calcaneum is free to move about the longitudinal axis, which is calcaneal can go into inversion, eversion. But around the coronal axis, when I need the dorsiflexion, plantar flexion movement, and around the vertical axis, when I need adduction, abduction, because of the superimposed body weight, it does not freely move. So this is where your talus comes in picture. So that is going to be done by the talus while the calcaneum remains fixed. So for weight bearing pronation, my movements are going to be similar for calcaneum, which is there is going to be calcaneal eversion. But in terms of dorsiflex, uh, in terms of plantar flexion, adduction, it's my talus which is moving. So that is going to be in the direction opposite to my calcaneum, opposite to the direction uh, that happened in non-weight bearing. So it's calcaneal eversion talar plantar flexion and talar adduction. Whereas in non-weight bearing, we saw calcaneal eversion, calcaneal dorsiflexion, calcaneal abduction. Okay. So keep that in mind when we are talking about the weight bearing position. And a foot that appears fixed in this position in pronation is pes planus or a flat foot versus supination where it is called a pes cavus. Now, what is the effect of uh, weight bearing subtalar motion on the leg? Now, what happens is in weight bearing supination or pronation, uh, you have abduction or adduction and dorsiflexion or plantar flexion of the talus. Now, if you remember, the talus is in my mortise. So, if there is any movement of the talus, it's going to have movement on my proximal articular surfaces, which is my distal and the tibia fibula. So, the talus is going to move. Now, the body of the talus is lodged within the mortise. So, let's say when the talus goes into abduction, in a weight-bearing supination position. So, the body has to rotate laterally. Now, when the body rotates laterally, the motion is minimal, okay, of the talus. So, what is going to happen? The superimposed proximal articular surface is going to move. So, when the body is moving laterally, this motion is limited and the superimposed proximal articular surfaces are going to move into lateral rotation. So, whenever I have supination, I am going to have lateral rotation of the leg as well. And non-weight bearing positions, we, there is no, uh, both of these motions are inter, inter, interdependent because you have the calcaneum moving and not the talus. Moving further to the transverse tarsal joint. Now this is formed by the talonavicular. So this is my talonavicular joint and you have the calcaneocubal joint. So if you see, this is an S-shaped structure and it is immobile in a weight bearing foot. So, talonavicular is formed between the convex head of the talus and the concave aspect of the posterior aspect of the navicular bone. And it shares this joint capsule with my subtalar joint like we had discussed. So, in weight bearing, it is linked with the subtalar joint and hence it can be called as the talocalcaneal navicular joint.
my calcaneo cuboid joint the articular surface of both the calcaneum and cuboid are reciprocally concave convex side to side as well as top to bottom so this makes it um a relatively immobile joint in weight bearing subtalar supination or pronation the calcaneus has to move on the relatively fixed cuboid and meet that conflicting intraarticular demands of the opposite saddle shaped structure so that causes a twisting motion at this joint coming to the ligaments so the inferior aspect is formed by the spring ligament um yeah we can see it here the inferior aspect is formed by the spring ligament which is spanning from my calcaneum to the navicle and it is also called the floor and the medial wall of the talonavicular joint uh during standing considerable support is required in this region because the body would tends to depress the head of the talus in the plantar and medial direction that is towards the earth so medially by deltoid ligament you have the support and laterally by the bifurcate ligament so here we have the support now bifurcate ligament has two components you have the calcaneo navicular fiber which reinforces the capsule laterally and you have the calcaneo cuboid fiber okay which is going to form the primary bond between the calcaneus and the cuboid uh we have two axes of motions when we talk about this joint we have the longitudinal and we have the oblique so longitudinal axis if you see is nearly coinciding with the straight ap axis with the primary components of eversion inversion okay whereas if you see the oblique axis in contrast to this it has a very strong vertical component and a medial lateral component so motion around this axis will occur as a combination of abduction and dorsiflexion and adduction and plantar flexion so if you see here the pronation in non weight bearing they have shown as the main components being abduction and dorsiflexion and adduction and plantar flexion talking about the interplay of the subtalar and the transverse tarsal joint function so the first um the images have gone a bit up and down we have c and d here which is talking about supination of the foot and we have a and b here which is talking about pronation of the foot so pronation and supination when the foot is in an unloaded or non weight bearing will tell you about how the subtalar and the transverse tarsal joints have an interplay if you see in diagram c and a my calcaneum is held fixed okay so my pronation and supination will primarily occur at the midfoot which is depicted by this blue region correct when the calcaneus is free to move which is diagram d and b you can see that it's the hind foot and the midfoot both having the motion so pronation and supination is going to be as a summation of movements occurring across both these joints so what happens is the pull of the tibialis posterior muscle in d you can see the pull of the tibialis posterior muscle uh it will direct active supination over both rear foot and mid foot but uh in non weight bearing supination so what is happening the tibialis posterior we know is the prime supinator now because of my rigid calcaneo cuboid joint inverting and adducting the calcaneus that is happening in supination will draw the lateral column so if this is my leg and this is the lateral aspect so i'm talking about the um when supination occurs the lateral aspect of the leg of the foot sorry is going to be drawn under the medial column okay the pull of the muscle will contribute to a spin of the navicular navicle around the convex head of the talus and it will raise the medial longitudinal arch and in pronation the opposite is going to happen because of pull of the peroneus longus so in my supination my tibialis posterior is the prime muscle which is going to raise the arch of the the medial longitudinal arch and pronation it's going to be my peroneus longus which gives the pull as compared to non weight bearing weight bearing motion is relatively uh, different so what is happening in this weight bearing position if you you see there is a medial rotation of the tibia okay which is giving pronation now if this continues without compensation what is going to happen the lateral border is going to come off the ground 
if I have medial rotation of the leg, my uh, pronation is happening. Now, if that pronation is not supported, what is going to happen? The lateral aspect is going to come off the ground. The transverse ta tarsal joint, which is mobile, will effectively absorb this hind foot pronation. Okay. When the talus and calcaneum move on the fixed navicular cuboid unit, there is going to be relative supination. So, what is happening? I have a rare foot pronation and there will be relative supination of the other unit because of my transverse tarsal joint, which is mobile. Okay. And that is going to keep my foot on the ground while allowing the hind foot to go into pronation. But in reality, this is not the case. So, what happens is if you see this picture, so I have one foot which is a step ahead than the other. What is happening is my transverse tarsal joint ideally can move into either supination or pronation depending on what is the demand of the terrain on which the individual is standing. Okay. For example, let's say that uh, I'm standing on a ground and there is a stone under the medial forefoot. So what is going to happen? The medial forefoot is going to obviously supinate to a greater degree to maintain that contact. Now, if that supination range is not available, what is going to happen? The tarsal joint, let's say the tarsal joint is not mobile, that is the supination range is not available. The rock will also put the hind foot into supination and that is going to stress my lateral collateral ligaments. Okay. In bilateral standing position on a flat land, both will pronate slightly to allow the foot to absorb the body weight. When a person is standing on an uphill, the foot which is placed ahead will have to pronate more to maintain the contact with the ground. So, uh, theoretically, we agree that whatever is going to happen according to the biomechanics, but practically, it's going to be different when you see the uh, terrain on which the individual is standing. So, as long as my transverse tarsal joint is free to move in either of either pronation or supination, uh, the foot is okay. Coming to the tarsometatarsal joint, now, when you talk about this, the first thing we talk about is the unit. That is the functional unit of this, which is ray. Okay, it is formed by the metatarsal and the tarsal to which it is connected. So, let's say my first unit, the first ray is formed by the first metatarsal and the medial cuneiform. The second with the middle and the borders of the medial and the lateral cuneiform. The third with the lateral cuneiform and the fourth and fifth together with the cuboid. Now this is my axis for the fifth ray and this is for the first ray. So if you see the axis of the first ray, what is happening? The axis is aligned such that when there is dorsiflexion of the first ray, that's going to be inversion and adduction. And fifth ray axis is such that when there is dorsiflexion, it is going to be accompanied by eversion and abduction. Third, uh, the axis for the third metatarsal is uh, coinciding with the coronal axis. So it's going to be pure dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. And my second ray is the least mobile ray. Coming to uh, joint motion. So where we talk about supination twist and pronation twist. Now, uh, the twist is not required if my transverse tarsal is able to compensate for any hind foot motion that is happening. If not, my tarsometatarsal has to act. Okay, so we'll discuss about the supination twist, not discussing both because that will be kind of confusing. So we'll first go only with the supination twist. Now, when the hind foot rotates in weight bearing, let's see this picture. My hind foot, the person is in weight bearing, the hind foot has gone into pronation. Okay, my transverse tarsal will supinate to compensate for that like we saw in the earlier. Now, if that supination range is not sufficient, what is going to happen? The medial forefoot will press into the ground because everything is going into pronations. The medial forefoot is going to press into the ground and the lateral forefoot is going to be lifted off the ground. Okay. Now, the first and the second ray will be pushed into dorsiflexion because of ground reaction force while muscles controlling the fourth and fifth will plantar flex in order to maintain the force with the ground or maintain the contact with the ground. So, both together will cause inversion around a hypothetical axis and that is what is supination twist and vice versa is my pronation twist. 
talking about metatarsophalangeal joint so we have three types of uh, foot based on the metatarsal limb the first one is index plus which is also called the egyptian foot where the first metatarsal is longer than the remaining uh, metatarsals the second one is an index minus or the morton's foot where my second metatarsal is longer and then you have the first third fourth and fifth progressively now it is hypothesized that this causes increased force on the head of the second metatarsal which predisposes into injuries such as stress fractures which is commonly seen uh, on the second metatarsal and then you have the index plus minus which is the roman foot where the first and second are almost of the same length Next, talking about the sesamoid bones and the plantar plate. Now, the structure is very analogous to what we have in the hand, in the MCP joint, with few exceptions. Now, unlike my MCP, the range, there are two differences in my MCP and my MTP joint. Uh, first is that the range of extension exceeds that of flexion. Now, that is because in weight-bearing stance, my cartilage has to remain clear over here on the plantar surface, and that restricts my range of flexion. Another difference is that there is no opposition here like we have in hand. The hallux is going to move exclusively in the same direction that all of the all other four digits are going to move. Okay. Sysomoid bones, we have commonly seen two sysomoid bones under the head of the of the first metatarsal. Okay. So they are nicely placed in this groove that you see and separated by this uh, ridge over here. Now, this sesamoid bone is going to act as an anatomical pulley for uh, flexor hallucis brevis and it also protects the tendon of longus in uh, weight-bearing position. And in neutral position, they are going to be lodged in the groove, but when there is toe extension which is greater than 10 degrees, they will not lie in this groove. They will become unstable and chronic instability of this will lead to any MTP joint deformity, like acute fractures, stress fractures, osteonecrosis. Any inflammation, second condition is any inflammation around this sesamoid bone here is going to call, is called as sesamoiditis. Prolonged jumping, running, gymnastics, all these, especially in a uh, pest cavus foot, they are more susceptible to this condition because in a pest cavus, I directly have my head of the metatarsal uh, taking absorbing all the forces uh, of the ground the stability around this is going to be provided by one the plantar plates which is structurally similar to my volar plate which is found in the hand and uh, second is uh, also the plantar plate is available only from the second to the fifth digit my first digit Talking about the metatarsal break, this is one of the most important uh, concepts here. Now, when rising on toes, the MTP joint goes into extension, which is called the metatarsal break. Now, this occurs around, uh, around this axis, the oblique axis that you see here. Okay. Now, this obliquity helps, actually helps it to evenly distribute the load across the metatarsal head and toes. If the axis was not oblique, but rather, it was a true coronal um, axis. What is going to happen? Excess amounts of weight would have been placed on the first two digits. So the obliquity actually shifts the weight laterally, minimizing that stress on the first two joints. Now, when the heel goes into, uh, so when the heel rises in weight bearing, there has to be active contraction of the plantar flexors. Now, these muscles will contribute to supination first at the subtalar and the transverse tarsal. And only after the hind foot, mid foot get locked in a position of supination, the entire foot will act as a unit. The mid foot and the hind foot will act as one unit and then will cause the metatarsal extension. So that will the metatarsal break will be caused after that. Okay, in which my metatarsal uh, head will glide in a posterior and plantar direction. And then my body is going to be maintained on that metatarsal head and toes. One of the most important concepts, which is plantar arches. So we all know there is a longitudinal arch and a transverse arch. The first figure is showing us the longitudinal arch. So we have the lateral 
we have the lateral longitudinal arch and the medial longitudinal arch. If you see, the medial longitudinal arch is higher than the lateral and the longitudinal ar uh, arch actually goes from the calcaneum right till the metatarsal head. The keystone of this is my talus. Compared to that, my transverse arch goes across the remaining tarsals and it kind of dips when it reaches the head of the metatarsal. So the keystone here is going to be my medial, uh, sorry, my middle cuneiform and my second metatarsal. Okay. So what is the function of the arches? Dampening of any weight bearing forces, superimposed rotational forces, distribution of weight through the foot and also converting the foot into a, uh, from a flexible foot to a rigid liver. So let's talk about the plantar aponeurosis. Now the plantar uh, aponeurosis actually begins right here from the medial tubercle of the calcaneum, goes on till the plantar plate and the proximal phalanx. Okay, function is similar. Now let's assume this is my strut. Okay, so I have a posterior strut which is made by the calcaneum and the talus, and I have an anterior strut which is made by the remaining tarsals and my metatarsal. This is connected by this plantar fascia which is going to act like my thyroid. Okay. What happens is when there is superimposed body weight, my two struts are going to be subjected to compressive forces. By this thyroid, thyroid is going to be uh, subjected to tensile forces. So the bending moment that happens is going to be very minimal. Okay. Now the metatarsal head is here acting like a pulley around which my aponeurosis is wrapped. Okay. And it gets tensed when the toe goes into extension heel and the MTB. So what happens is, just a second. Yeah. So the metatarsal head acts as a pulley around which my aponeurosis is pulled when the toe goes into extension, when the heel and MTB, where the heel and the MTB are coming closer together. The toe goes into extension and the thyroid is going to pull the two ends, which is the calcaneum, the heel and my metatarsal. Because of this, the arch will be raised and it contributes to supination of the foot. So this entire thing is what we call as the windlass mechanism. Now what happens in people who have a dropped arch? Now a person who has a moderate or severe pest planus, they typically have a compromised ability to dissipate that load because if you see my plantar fascia here, my aponeurosis is actually stretched. It is not even stretched, it's overstretched and it gets weakened. Okay, you see this red spring here that is depicting my plantar fascia. So it has overstretched, it has weakened and it cannot accept the body weight which has been superimposed on it. So what is going to happen? All my extrinsic and intrinsic muscles which are will kind of get active and they are going to pro provide the secondary source of support to the arch. And the active forces from the intrinsic and extrinsic muscles, which are required to right now compensate because my plantar fascia is not working, are going to result in increased muscular activity, which will contribute to fatigue and various overuse syndromes in these people. Okay. This we have already seen that my body weight 50% goes to the calcaneum and the rest 50% goes to the midfoot and the forefoot. And the interphalangeal joints, like in the fingers, each toe has a proximal and a distal IP, except the hallux, which just has one IP joint. And um, yeah, and then you have the collaterals, the plantar plates, the capsules, which are smaller and less refined. Mobility around the IP is limited primarily to flexion and extension. Coming to the kinetics of the foot. So we have finished the kinematics right from the talocrural to the IP joint. Coming to the kinetics of the muscles which are going to actually work around the ankle. So you have the anterior compartment muscles which is the tibialis anterior, my extensors and peroneus tertius. Now these muscles are active eccentrically to control the soft landing of foot. Now in early stance, the moment you're going to heel contact, I don't need it to just go like this. I need this, a soft landing. That is where these muscles come into picture. They, active, they are active eccentrically. Okay, now this eccentric activity, especially the tibialis anterior, is going to help lower the arch and control the movement of pronation which is occurring at the rear foot. During swing phase, what happens? 
they will work concentrically because now I need them to dorsiflex, to extend the toes, to clear the foot off the ground. So to do this, I will need them to work, uh, to go into dorsiflexion, extend the toes to clear foot off the ground. For dorsiflexion to occur in a pure sagittal plane, my inversion eversion forces must be balanced, which means my tibialis anterior and my peroneus tertius, both these muscles have to be balanced. In case if my tibialis and if there is isolated tibialis anterior paralysis, my dorsiflexion will still occur because I still have my peroneus tertius, but now it is going to be accompanied with eversion. Then I have my lateral compartment muscles, which is primary, which are the primary everters, providing the main stability at the lateral aspect. So you have the peroneus longus and brevis. Also, remember conditioning, strengthening, coordination exercises of these muscles is very important when you go in your rehab of inversion sprain injuries. Okay. Yeah. So let's um since uh the longest is the one which inserts at the first tarsometatarsal joint, it is going to give a eversion to torque to the first digit as well, which is evident when the foot is in pronated position in non-weight bearing. So the first digit will evert and will depress slightly. Also, it provides stability to the first digit against the medial pull of the tibialis anterior, without which my first tray would otherwise uh, migrate medially and that would give rise to hallux valgus. The lateral compartment muscles are going to work eccentrically, specifically during the middle and late stance to control the supination because post the moment my foot goes into heel contact when there is pronation, Later on, middle to late stages, it goes into supination. That is where I will need these muscles to actually control that supination movement. The longest is going to help fixate that first tray on the ground. In case if there is paralysis of this muscle, what is going to happen is the tip post, my tibialis posterior, will work in a, it's going to give an unopposed supination pull. And the forefoot will go into supination. So then the person is going to walk on the lateral border. I have my posterior compartment muscles, mainly the triceps surae, the tibialis posterior and the FDL and FHL. So let's talk about these two concepts, activation of the plantar flexors and supinators during walking. Now between foot flat and heel off, the plantar flexors are going to work eccentrically to decelerate the dorsiflexion. And between heel off and toe off, where I need that push off, there is going to be concentric activity of my plantar flexors. My deep muscles are going to assist in supination of the rear foot, out of which my tip post is the most significant. So when the foot contacts the ground, my tip post is going to decelerate the pronating rear foot. The rear foot was pronating. It is going to decelerate the pronating rear foot and gradually help in lowering the medial longitudinal arch through the eccentric action. Okay, so people in whom this occurs rapidly, that there is rapid pronation during stance phase, it will place excessive demand on the, on this muscle, on the tip post, giving rise to muscle uh, fatigue, tendinopathy. So when there's reduced function of tibialis posterior, it is going to limit the shock absorption capacity of the mechanism of the foot. And throughout the mid to late stance, the contraction of tip post will help guide the rear foot through supination. So initially it's going to work as eccentric and then later on it's going to go into a concentric mode. The second is plantar flexion torque generated for propulsion. So my triceps surae will provide the main propulsive force for walking. Secondary energy sources which can be uh, specifically in early stance where you have the ipsilateral hip extensors working and towards the late stance, you have the ipsilateral hip flexors working. Now, all of these plantar flexor muscles, the gastro and soleus are by far the most powerful. And theoretically, they are capable of producing roughly 80% of the total plantar flexion torque, which is actually produced at the ankle joint. These are my intrinsic muscles. So, I have four layers. And the last thing that we're going to discuss is the biomechanics of raising up on tiptoes. Now, what happens is maximally raising the body. If you see in this, when I have to maximally raise the body, there are two concurrent internal plantar flexion torque. One which is occurring at my talocrural joint and one that is occurring at my MTP joint. Now, the plantar flexors, which here are represented by the gastrocnemius, plantar flex the talocrural joint, okay? So they are rotating the calcaneus and talus within the mortise. 
and the primary torque used to raise the body, however, occurs through extension at the MTP joint. Okay, let's assume my MTP is the fulcrum. My superimposed body weight is here. And this is my effort, which is produced by the gastrocnemius. If you see, my effort arm is greater than my weight arm. Okay, which means that there is a greater mechanical advantage, which is very rare. Let's assume this ratio to be roughly 3 is to 1. And it is a very highly mechanical advantage. And the muscle needs to produce a lifting force of only one third or say 33% of the body weight to support that plantar flex position. Okay. This also tells us about the importance of how, of how important it is to get maximal amount of extension at the MTP joint. Not only do the plantar flex the muscles use these joints to increase their internal moment arm, but as described earlier, full extension of these joints is going to pull the plantar fascia taut via the Vinlas mechanism, which is going to help the intrinsic muscles support my arch and maintain a rigid forefoot allowing the foot to accept the load imposed by the body. Okay. So that was it for today. These are my references. We, uh, I have taken all the content from Norkins, Newman and Otis to be precise. Thank you, everyone. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Parak Sanjeti, Chairman of Sanjeti Group, and uh, Manisha Sambhi, Ma'am Chairperson, Sanjeti Healthcare Academy for their constant guidance and support. Um, our principal, Dr. Apurva Shimpi, sir, for giving me this opportunity and all the Physio TV viewers, uh, also our technical team and all our viewers. See you next time. Thank you.